Until you were chopping wood and it broke the radiator with a piece of wood that came off the axe. Yeah, the motorbike's not going, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, like to do a bit of hiking, a bit of surfing. Um, part of my inspiration for regenerative farming was that I wasn't doing any more of this, I was just spraying. You don't do any more of that at the moment either, though. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, towards the, the kind of last days of our continual cropping program, so we've been very conventional year in, year out, weed sheep farmers. Um, and we had some really good success with it, and I, I ran into a wall of weeds eventually. We've got some quite shallow soil types, a lot of wild radish, a um, lot of ryegrass, um, and it was becoming a bit of a nightmare, and I was spraying, I was spending a lot of my time spraying, and I was getting sick of that. And that led me to the question, what's really going on here? What, what is my real issue? And we started down that regenerative path of looking at looking at soil, looking a little deeper, um, and to go on a few years, um, these are the, the principles that for our farm, so I won't go into those in depth. Um, most of them are pretty quite, are quite self-explanatory. Um, diversity of plants, I know that's been touched on here a lot today. Um, we brought the animals back into the system as well. And we started growing a lot of diverse things to try and address soil constraints. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry if I'm blocking people from seeing here. Um, that was tillage, uh, tillage radish. Started making um, compost as well. So 2013, and there's been a lot of talk about Joel, thanks for um, transformative change and incremental bits for us. You should transformative. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. We turned off the tap for the synthetic, synthetic fertiliser in 2013, started making <coughs> compost and then value adding that compost. Wow. And um, 
we designed a compost extractor and we started making our own compost extracts. So with those um, compost extracts, we were adding things that were mentioned to our like the forty bags with you mates. So um, a portion of it was off farm that you had to get in? Uh, originally, I was buying in a really fungal compost. I was chasing a fungal component, given that our soils can be quite bacterially dominated. We now make our own because we have more of the resources to do that. Um, and I wasn't a compost maker, I didn't know anything about it really. That's right, yeah. So it started learning curve. Um, and, and I have to point out we're under no illusions and don't want you to be either. We, we are here where we are with lots of failure and blood and sweat. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Yeah, so liquid injection onto um, disc cedar. That's a John Deere 1890 disc drill. You can see liquid injection pipes there. I've gone through various um, variations of this where I, for a long time, I literally stuck those, the green friction lines straight into the airline because there was no fertilizer, no compound fertilizer. I just literally sprayed it straight into the airline, coated seed on the way into the ground. Which works quite well, except things modules start to run wet when you do that. Mm. So you can get more friction and more wear, but it does work quite well. Um, back in the kind of around 2010, we started looking at having having that um, living roots in soil all year round. So I went after um, subtropical C4 annuals back then. This is white French millet, and you can just see the sheer size and yeah. um, of the plant. Um, how old's the plant? Yeah, like how long it take to... It can take a while in our environment. Um, that would have been sown, um, would have been sown in early September. Oh, yeah. So that there, looking at it's probably, I don't know, uh, December. Yeah, that's when we had a lot of summer rain, hey? We, we just happened to have a cycle of a lot of wet summers when we were doing this, which, mm. is, which is fantastic because, as a lot of you realise, we just came out of five months of no rain mm. until about three days ago. Um, not, a, not a cracker. Mm. And it was occurring to me while we were doing this what happens if it doesn't rain. Mm. Because to bring a crop like this to harvest in our environment, it has to go in in the spring. Um, early September, you've got to spray out or remove everything that's living to get a cash crop um, like this. If you if you plant this kind of crop, um, especially millet, uh, you know, at harvest time or after harvest, you just won't get it. The harvestability is just not enough time and generally not enough moisture either. So we ended up growing it for cash crops and that was going to the seed market. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of fun with um, white French millet. And we found that if that was our desiccation, we would just cut it because it, was, it, it didn't ripen properly either. Um, so we would just swap it and then pick up the rows we were using on pick up fronts for that. Um, we, we trialed corn, dry land corn, uh, maize, uh, sorry, sorghum, sedan. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, <laughs> and these are, the kind of, these are the kind of mixes that we were mucking around with. There's mm -hmm. mung beans and corn and all sorts of <laughs> Or did you buy them? Uh, we, we made those mixes, so we were just bought the individual seeds and blended them up. And when we started doing this, it was quite cool to see it getting, <laughs> getting out the seeds. It was good to see you, Kevin. <laughs> um, but that's an example of one of those multi species, so you can really see the sunflowers mm -hmm. there, but there's a whole um, mm -hmm. story there as well. Yeah. And, and the other story stuff did come up, you didn't kind of yep. do most of what you put <coughs> actually. It was, it was all there, yep. Wow. This, this just gives you um, a really good idea about how a stand, so I sowed white French millet um, later in the season here and I had it sown on this side, that's just a bit of volunteer millet and you can see all the green, you see all the rye grass mm. on the right hand side there. Zoomed in on the grass and if you have a look down, I mean this is a generalisation but it was, it was pretty much the standard across the farm, everywhere we had a really good stand of white French millet, whether it was planted at harvest or earlier on, it just suppressed all of the weeds. So it was suppressing, it was holding back the dry grass, the tapeweed, you name it. So then we started to realise that we could get away from non-selective fertilisers like Roundup, Paraquat, 
So we started selling all of our props with no knockdown. Um, that's in the wrong place, but <laughs> that, oh, we'll come back to that one. Um, this, this is an example of, um, of a winter um, cover crop mix. So you can see lupins and field peas and oats and all sorts of things in there. Um, and there's been talk of markets today, people were mentioning you know, the profitability and the viability of this kind of crop in our part of the world. We found a really good market for poultry um, and some mates of ours hot on our hills that are, sell that are selling this kind of mix rate into the, um, the dairy market down in, in the south. And they're, they're finding amazing results as well with their meat production going up. So it's exciting stuff. Well, that's because your grain from that would be so well fed, just by the nutrients in the soil. Are you finding you're getting a premium because you're doing things a bit Certainly. more quality and less chemicals? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, and this was a really common scene for us with you know, harvesting and, and planting at the same time. So <laughs> we were, um, there would generally be a mix in that air seeder. Um, and there's an example of it after harvest. You can see the, the millet and this also lupins. What we realised was that if you had a really good canopy over the top, lupins would, would survive 40 degree days, no problem at all. Um, they were, they were coexisting. So we were, and they were modulating in our summers as well, so we were able to fix nitrogen in, in summer. So do you then um, harvest quite high, so you leave a really tall straw base, or...? Yep. Yeah. You try and leave as much residue. It just depends what the scenario is, and I love a stripper. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just because we, we come into perennial systems later on, um, we end up with a lot of green material in our, in our samples, so I'm having to swap some crops still. Um, and this is this was a really good scenario. This is volunteer millet um, and lupins that had come up, and it does it will disappear eventually out of the system if you don't refresh it. And that's what it looks like selling into that kind of stand of um, summer cover of millet. And you don't just see the air seeder, um, and that's what the weed establishment would look like under that kind of amount of um, biomass. So you can see it was really just suppressing. <laughs> so you don't have any issue yeah. with like when you're trying to see just the bank of, um, and that's yeah. Like, that's it. Sharp, really sharp. Okay. You use on a on a single use mm. not to deal with that. Mm -hmm. It's better dry, of course, than, mm. than it is wet. Um, so at, by this stage, all of our crops we were growing, we were still using some in crop uh, herbicide, but no non-selective herbicides. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this was a. Uh, this was a barley crop that had, um, so I did use a broad leaf, you can see the lupins in there. Um, I, I sprayed it for the market, but now I hopefully I don't change the market because I didn't want to spray it all, so. Same crop. Um, and we, we experimented with this system, um, that's um, a harvested white French millet crop. Um, lupins straight in there and just, um, a grass selective and a broad leaf spray on that crop. I don't grow monocultures of anything anymore. I don't grow lupins like that anymore either. We had some really good success, but um, as you all know, um, you can if you don't have an early an early break with um, with lupins um, and field peas in our environment, they're real pussies. They just kind of crawl on it. Um, field peas in a similar kind of environment. About 2015, I started um, researching the subtropical um, C4 perennial plants. Um, I was still in the back of my mind thinking about the dry summer that we're going to have, and um, this inspired me a lot. It's probably wheat on the right hand side, and you can just see the, the difference between the perennial mm. plants and the annual plants. So I had started investigating the perennials and what might grow at Holland's Track Farm, and I was told um, by all the experts that they wouldn't grow at Holland's Track Farm at all. It was, um, we had frost, uh, it was too cold. When I asked them what the plants do generally in the cold part of the season, they, they are dormant anyway. So frost, frost just doesn't affect them, it's just not a problem because they're all, they're all basically asleep. 
So this was our first kind of organic trial where we, um, we isolated a mix of lupins and vets into a multi-species of perennial. So there's um, a bunch of panics and rose grass, um, lucerne and chicory, and then um, it just turned into a map. <laughs> we harvested that. And what was really exciting was when we had a little bit of summer rain that just went away and went. So then the next, the obvious progression was what's going to be all this? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <coughs> Through that, you know, I took that. Um, what's that there, this one? Is that rose grass? That's uh, digit. Oh, digit. Yeah. Um, it rained, what, three, three days ago or so. And I took this like a, a week or two ago. So no rainfall at all. That's what our farm looked like where the perennials had been established. That's a two-year-old stand. So not a cracker for um, five months, and you can still you know, you can feed animals on that. So there we've been um, trialling digit grass, and as you can see, that's going really well as well in our environment. Do you that stuff? Yep, we do now. And um, I just three days ago, I, I sold I sold a whole bunch. I sold about 150 hectares of perennials, a mix similar to this. Uh, we're now getting things like kangaroo grass, which are native to Western Australia or to Australia, and you can't actually sow them in an air seeder unless you put them to something else. So we're squirreling them in with all the other perennial seeds and getting them in the ground. So we're hoping that they they like our environment. Um, I, look, I had to cut um, hay in January, so despite the dry, we were still able to cut um, green loose, and that was just for the hens. So the, the, um, the cattle turned up and we, we have adopted the holistic grazing as much as we can, um, provided you know, we're, not, we're not too strung out doing other things. But um, <laughs> that's, that's the ideal, because our paddocks are quite large. We ripped a lot of fences out going to cover cropping and haven't had time to put them all back yet. So using hot wires, um, if anyone's interested in holistic management and doesn't know much about it, I recommend checking out the Savory Institute online. There's um, most of what you need to know. Um, so we had a, we bought in a whole lot of um, square meter Murray Grays, and they've been crossed with a speckled park, as you can see. And then we got a little more serious, and we started buying in some stud um, animals, and we really like the Murray Grays. It's just an example of the, the kind of crude setup. Um, just some hot wire material on a trailer. It was, um, it's all pretty simple, but pretty efficient. Is that kiwi It is, yeah. Yep. And the diversity started turning up not long after we got the cattle, dung beetles. Actually, this, this lady turned up with that. Three weeks ago. Yeah, I feel we sad away, trying this. <laughs> we're away and got home, and I don't have any red peppers. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And she was mad as a tough snake, and all of the, the whole herd, like the, the bull we had, or the two bulls we had, were quiet. You can walk up to them and touch them. They were all dancing around. I thought, hello, we're going to have a problem with yeah. <laughs> So, anyway, we can, there was only one solution, really. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it up there. <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of um, different sorts of dung beetles and oh, yeah, um, spider. spiders all over the there's actually the they're the treadings on that um, fencing gear. Yeah. And then we um, I, we were wheat sheep and um, I, I, I missed eating our own land, so we got a bunch of um, shedding sheep back in. So we've been having fun, kind of breeding. I think we're breeders now. <laughs> <laughs> this is super sheep. <laughs> um, this is just some other trial work that we've been doing. Um, that's a that's a crimp roller. It's a little bit dark. Yeah, there. it is a bit dark. But we made up a, a just a small, a small, a small <laughs> section of um of crimp roller, and that's that's a trial. That's a trial of, yeah. um, that was cereal rye. And because um, I know crimp rolling is, is pretty big in the States and I don't know, probably in part of Canada as well. More of the States in Canada, sure. Um, and I just wanted to 
see if that's, that's the same for any stand that I started experimenting with underneath that. I just wanted to see what would happen to yeah. that perennial stand that kind of thing yeah, by it's pretty and amazing. Stuff and, it. Mm. and then in my wisdom I thought I'd sow um, sunflowers and things like that but they don't get on that's why I'm cereal rice sunflowers I don't think I saw one oh. I just <laughs> barely a bad effect that's what he took them out it was really interesting um, so here's some photos of um what our, what our kind of cropping enterprise look, looks like now. Um, so we now sow our catch crops straight back into living subtropical C4 plants, and there's a, there's a whole range of canic, canicums in there um, Gatton canic and Bambatsi canic, um, some lucerns, chicory, um, some rose grasses, and now we're, we're getting into some natives and, um, and the digit as well. So are you um, seeding monocultures at the moment? No. Cash crops are all polyculture. All multi, all multi species. Yeah. Yep. Can you get on with grading? Bye bye. There, um, if you have a look in there, you can see the diversity in the understory. You can see the lucerne, and there's chicory and all sorts of things going on down mm -hmm. in the down in the intro road. <coughs> um, that's just a bit further along. We went back and we've been trialling the older varieties, um, white peach of barley. Um, gone back to older wheat varieties and. the cereal wire standing out of the crop there <coughs> um, and we have generally loops and field peas in that mix as well. Um, I've just sown, um, I've just un under sown all of our latest, latest um, perennials with cereal. Um, being a bit slow, um, a bit slow with the cereal but I think that's probably going to be a really good fit, a really good fit with, that, with our mix as well. Um, and then it looks quite dry there, but occasionally if, the, um, if we have late rain, that lucerne can really stand up and make, for example, quite, quite green. So um, sometimes we cut it down and just pick up the whole lot and see it's quite green underneath there. So a couple of years ago, we got bored. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Our first chicken caravan, and that answers part of your question. So a lot of our grain goes back back through our own enterprise. As of November, um, there was three thousand bird. Um, so we've got quite a few more caravans these days, and that we still have those markets if we need them. The um, the pork and poultry market, um, and I haven't I haven't needed to talk to the dairy either. Yeah. So basically, you so it closed that loop pretty much, so grain's going straight back around. And this picture of the brooders. So you're raising all your own chicks? So we buy in day old, day old birds. Um, we've changed the brooder now, that was a bit painful. That was the super shed. Oh, so yeah. Not, not more self out. Yeah. The and then we moved it after that. They were there um, yeah. back in there again. Yep. Yep. Um, so, I, and we're we're really interested, I guess, in the in the food in the food side of of farming, um, mm. and it's why why we've titled our our presentation "Back to Food" because we are concerned about the sovereignty of food and hanging on to the the small family farm that is really invested in food and its quality. Um, because the more I look at um, enterprises that really focus on, on human health from a, from a food, soil health um, perspective and focuses on um, you know, humanity from that angle, all the rest of these kind of environmental issues seem to come into line as well. Mm. Do you want to add anything else? 
Um, yeah, so Wheat World Integrity Group, I think Nick mentioned, we, we started that in 2014 with an amazing committee and John Hicks is here today. He's on our committee and, yep, it's a great, great resource. Um, and so, yeah, I just encourage you to go to www.wig.farm and membership is free. And I think there's another slide, Nick, and um, I've ventured into Instagram on the idea to kind of attract the city to the country and promote the whole paddock to plate idea. Um, and we're on Facebook as well. So, yeah. And we have an annual field day, I nearly forgot that bit, um, in Newdigate every year as well. So. October usually. And your farm, or is that part of the UK field day? Uh, no, it's our, well, we call it our field day, but um, WIG field day. Oh, WIG, yeah. yeah. No, and on our farm, yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. So we have a lot of questions during that. Does other, any more questions? I'd just like to ask you, in the changing of your system, kilos per hectare are a vital yield that you get from your crop as an average at yep. that time of the year. Have you got, can you just check so you're talking um, cash crop, yeah. cash crop yields. So we went from, I guess, kind of conventional yields given the season um, in our area to, you know, if, we, if I do a tonne per hectare in that kind of environment, I'm pretty happy. Um, but we've done worse. If, if, you, if it's a perennial pasture, I've got trial, I've trialed it everywhere. I've put wherever it to see what would happen. Um, it's just a non-event. You have to have the perennial stand and it has to be reasonably dominant. Um, and that takes time. So the longer you do it, you, you plant into that you know, the better it gets. And as that changes the soil well and sequesters carbon and all of the other things that, that Joel and Kevin have been talking about today, um, I wouldn't be so disappointed even at half a ton under that, you know, I'd be pretty disappointed. But um, it's, you know, I guess in this system, I've changed my mindset about what's, what's a win. I don't, you know, it's from a financial perspective, it's, I don't have it after I don't have to go and borrow inputs because most of it's, you know, we're cycling it ourselves. Mm. So given that you always have made the jump from conventional to the regenerative process, um, how do you find, I suppose, in the end, the ultimate piece becomes making glue because we've all got to do it, mm. um, and lifestyle balance on those two converses to what you were before? Mm. <laughs> Well, it took us 10 years to get off the treadmill to get to, I guess, where we are now. Mm. Um, it's, there's, this, this is with challenge. It's not, you know, it's, it's not super easy or everyone else, everyone would be you know, doing it and jumping in because mm. we've, we've got a long way to go. Mm. Um, but I know what I would rather be doing and I'm, we're calling all the shots. Um, and where we're, our focus is, is healthy food basically mm. um, and a lot and I, I it does come down to lifestyle I mean Lucy could probably touch on that there's um, you know I've spent a lot of time on a boom spray like all of you people and um, I'd much prefer to be doing something you know I've traded that time for time yeah you know fencing for cows or looking you know, after chickens looking after hens or something mm. like that or you know cattle work sheep work yeah. and chasing chickens chasing chickens <laughs> Keeps you fit though. Yeah, are you making your compost now? If you're not doing it in the super shed, what are you doing now? That's a good question. Well that that's mainly chicken litter. So because there's a there's brooders with there was what nearly four thousand birds went through there through that brood, so that's a lot, a lot of chicken litter and, and sawdust and um, we had and some hay um, and dead things. Um, you know, all goes, all goes back into that compost and um, 
Yep, turn, just turning it with the front end loader. It's pretty, it's pretty crude, but we we finish it as a worm compost, so we get it so far and then put it under cover and keep it in that super shed. It's got, it's all irrigated, so I can just turn the water on and keep it as damp as I like and keep the worms happy so they get right through that. So you're taking oh. the chickens out at some stage? So the chickens have got nothing to do with that shed anymore. They're, they're, the whole brood has been yeah. moved somewhere else where I don't knock myself out. I yeah, because the bar was like here. <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry. Um, as I watch and listen to the different growers, a lot of the barriers that I see a lot of producers coming up towards making changes like you guys have is because they're waiting for definite proof from a particular series of studies that this stuff's going to work. And then I see people that are going and they're saying, well, we actually can never know everything because nature kind of knows a fair bit more than us. And, and how much in you guys' transition has involved trusting your intuition and partnering with nature versus waiting for a study to instruct you what to do or advice from an expert to instruct you what to do? Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was really privileged to listen to people like um, Ralph Dirch from Paraguay and Rick Beaver from mm -hmm. South Dakota. And Dwayne Beck. Dwayne Beck got to know um, Dr. Christine Jones and um, Jill Clapperton. Dr. Jill Clapperton um, did Doctor. some Elaining and saw food with courses. So there was that that education and um, tutoring side, mm. and then it, we had to try and work out how those principles applied to our environment. So that was where the rubber hit hit the road, really. But it, but if you if you do this in any environment, and it's been alluded to today, you climb over the fence and you have a look at the biomass and the yeah. diversity, and then you go back and look in our paddocks in a conventional system, and it's pitiful. You know what we're producing compared to what's over the fence. So yeah. the closer we can replicate that, I think, keeping in mind we we can't eat trees, it still it still has to be converted into protein or into something useful. Um, but I think if we can if we can harness those principles from there and apply them to the paddy, um, I think that's that's the that's the sharp learning curve doing that. So there's been both. There's there's and there's just mm. a lot of it's just been learning to fail well. Yeah. And sorry, uh, two more questions. Sorry, um, you talked about opening up new markets for yourself. How much of your um, time working in your business developing new markets has been taken up and away from your production time so time on the farm because you're trying to work opening up new markets because the industry as a whole currently doesn't really support market opportunities for this kind of product. Yeah, thankfully they came to us. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. They wanted, they had heard rumours of what we were doing and they there was demand already mm -hmm. there. They wanted it and they couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that was just that was, mutual friends. Yeah, just three friends and other contacts. Mm. Yep, friends that were kind of already situated in, in the southwest and already were into you know more intensive. There's still free range pasture, but pork and poultry systems. Yeah. Sorry, my last question. If you look at your whole system of now from is labour, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's just so intense. Getting hands on the ground, you know, it's getting people to to be consistent and to turn up and yeah. that's, that's our major challenge. That's really tricky. Yeah, you're training yeah, someone up and then... More, you know, you've got sheep, now you've got cows, now you've got yeah. you fencing to do, like just by taking on stock, yep. you've taken on this block and load extra bit of work. Yeah, it's that's right. It's going to be a struggle. It's yep, and the more intensive enterprises are the ones that chew up all of your time. Generally, they're also they can be where the where the finance where the cash is as well. Mm. Um, but you know, mm. it's it is intensive. Um, so we're we're actually working on partnerships at the moment. You know, where I'm angling for you know someone who's better at better at that system or yeah. better at that egg, egg enterprise than I am yeah. to yeah. come over and take that part over so that I can go and get into intensive pork or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's already told me about this, yes. Hey, they really did the secret. Not bad, yeah, but God, Nelly. Chop me. Yeah, so you've got a lot of 
say using any synthetic inputs here, or is it just all vermicast cast and yeah, it's not, not since um, 2013. And we have had um, deep herd take soil samples right across both farms. Actually, no, they just did the home place. And then they, then they did the neighbours as well because they wanted a bit of a comparison. Um, and even though our yields generally have been lower than a conventional system, we've, we were still exporting a lot of tonnes. There was still a lot of millet. And in that transition, there was still a lot of wheat and barley and lupins going out the gate, um, we still have plenty of phosphate. And when I said to um, Ronald Master from Albany, from Deep Herd, I said, because when he first came, he wasn't a believer, I said, how is that possible? And he said, well, it's obviously cycling. It's the only way that it can happen. So that was, you know, that's exciting to hear. You're using foliar spray more than part of the system. Yep. Yeah. Yep. About that, with your inputs, at the moment the conventional systems, we apply an input to achieve yield on our crop or improve function of livestock, blah, 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 profitability production of livestock. Are you guys changing your mindset around the inputs to, move, to improve your soil and ecosystem health and thus improve your production? Or is it still a direct correlation line between input to yield? Yeah, it's the former more so. Um, I don't. I never do a trial strip. I, I just. I, I do all of the crop, yeah. and I. It's very hard. It's very hard for me to measure. I know we can take the bricks. We can. We can check <coughs> sugar. We can see if we're having an impact, mm -hmm. um, and we can look at biology under a microscope, which we've done. We can see that if it's active or not. Um, very hard to to measure, you know, to put it on and equate it to tons per hectare or kilograms yeah. per hectare. But we you can see a crop pick up, you know, if you get to that <coughs> four to five leaf stage and the crop, you know, is starting to slow down, the foliage you can definitely see it pick up. Is that more on your annuals rather than fresh when you're putting in a fresh perennial seeding? Is that foliage pick up more on your that that fold that foliage is on the okay. on the annual cash flow. Yeah, and have you noticed requiring the same in your perennial establishments? I've, I've pretty much just let them go, put them in, and um, hope for the best with them. Um, sometimes, you know, we won't see the grasses for a whole season load. Um, we've had we're having to be smarter. It used to it used to be a lot easier to establish a, a diverse mix of perennials in a chemical system because it would be the same as establishing a white French millet stand. I could just hose everything down in the spring and just go and pop them in bare ground, and you know away they go. In perfect timing, warm soil. We still have moisture. You could get them all going. Um, I don't, I'm not going to till anything, I'm not going to rip it up and work it back to remove everything, so I've had to be smarter about my timing. Um, if you go too early with the broadleaf perennials and you get a false break, so you get 10 mil in January, you'll lose half your chicory and most of your loosen and they just won't make it through the summer. Mm. But if you put them in now, like the opening rain we just had, we know we're going to have enough moisture through the winter. And chicory and lucerne never play by the rules anyway, they just do what they want. <laughs> so you'll generally have, they'll hang on through the winter and if the, the grasses just, the seed will sit there for a long time. Mm. If they don't establish now, cut this, you know, next spring, you'll, you'll see them come through. Um, John. Uh, Nick. Uh, uh, you went, you effectively went cold turkey at one stage where you made a major transition. If a conventional farmer was to come to you and say, Nick, I want to go and follow your life at farming style, but I don't want to have to go through the trials and traumas that you've gone through in order to establish what's the best system. What system would you advise them? What would you advise them to do on day one and through the first season? Definitely Joel's suggestion, increments. Yeah. Wind, wind things back slowly while you know establishing biology. Um, I, I, I wouldn't do it differently if I had a choice. Well, maybe I would. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it, that's for sure. 
yep. yeah. it's got a lot of challenges because you, as Joel was alluding to your system can collapse because mm. you don't have the bio you don't have that functioning biology to support the system and we saw we certainly saw that in place mm. if, if I could make another comment I'm on next committee and I've attended probably the last five field days in a row and he never had the time to comment deeply on the poultry enterprise, which is eggs, and on the cattle enterprise. But on a small family farm, if you've got children who love to come home to the farm but you haven't got a job for them under conventional agriculture, here are two enterprises that you can integrate that on part of the land during the winter cropping season and provide livelihoods for those children without interfering significantly with the livelihood of the main enterprise. And it is the way that we will retain younger generations in the country areas and bring more population back in the farming districts. Yeah. You're right, John, and there's so many enterprises that you could stack on a farm yeah. like that. You know, there's your, your imagination is your only limitation. and. You know, the, the kids do enjoy it, especially when there's a bit of pocket money involved. They do, yeah. they, they get into it. Yeah. I was thinking about when you were talking about lifestyle change. I'd rather take the kids out chasing sheep and mustering cattle than spraying any day. So that's yeah. in itself a better form. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking about the incremental changes that we're talking about. It's one thing that is possibly a change that can happen really. <coughs> I guess more simple than not would be to put in perennials and then just keep doing what you normally do conventionally. Is that a possibility or do you sort of have to change your shift conventionally? Yeah, no, certainly there are there are we didn't have li any livestock at all when we made this, you know, radical change. And if if you already had if you already had livestock in the system it would be far easier. Mm. Um, we've had to bring them in after the fact. Does that be weed like your weed control? It's it's for the whole system whole system approach. It's for you know biological systems and soil health and the diversity that they bring to the enterprise mm. as well. Um, but yeah, certainly. Sorry, what was the other part of the question? Do you think it's as far as an incremental change instead of messing with your inputs and things like that? Would adding perennials? Yeah, be yeah, certainly. Okay. Yep, certainly because they do they do take time to establish and. Um, if, if you want to, you know, harvest a successful cash crop off those perennials, that takes time because you, people, um, Kevin talked about cape weed today, you know, that you can address that through chemical means to a degree. You can put some, if it's a calcium issue, you can put some calcium on. Um, but you can also, you can also outcompete it or you can change the biology and you can address that calcium issue with deep rooted perennials as well. And all, but all of this is time. So the sooner you get cracking on that kind of system, the better if that's the way you want to go. Did you say you're getting wallaby grass or kangaroo grass? Uh, wallaby grass we already have, and the kangaroo grass, we it's, it grows not far. Like if you go down towards Albany, around the kind of prong grass area, you'll see there's plenty of kangaroo grass around there. Very difficult to transplant or to steal from farmers or road verges or whatever. We just bought some from um, the eastern states, and it's. I had to give them my arm for mm. it. It's, it's only a tiny little bag. Yeah, it's not thousand dollars to mm. land half a kilo. Oh, so sure. very, very expensive. Mm. But um, well, hopefully we can get we can distribute you know enough seed because cattle will disperse that if you graze it at the right time. Mm. 